what I'm working on is not about keeping people older at the end of life and alive for longer. It's the opposite. We're keeping animals and increasingly we're showing with people that you can keep them younger for longer so that when you're 80, you can actually be 60. We're all interested to some extent, some people more than others in living a long time, but we all want that time to be full of vitality and productivity and not just living longer for the sake of, of living longer. And I think that's where the biological age versus your chronological age sort of becomes important. One of the ways that I've heard you talk about before is fasting. And, and it's super interesting because fasting isn't new. I mean, it used to be a necessity for us, but now we're starting to learn about why it's helpful. Can you talk a little bit about the benefits of fasting and how it relates to slowing down or even reversing aging? Mm. Yeah, well, these systems that tell cells how to read the genes at the right time, this epigenome, um, there are gene, there are factors that control that, um, and so a little, very little bit of biology here. Uh, DNA isn't just floating around the cell; it's actually looped into um, big loops that tell genes to be switched on, uh, and genes that should be switched off are bundled up tightly, um, and we call this stuff chromatin. And those those loops of genes that are on and bundles of genes that are off are controlled in part by a set of genes called the sirtuins. Um, and those genes make proteins that cause these loops and bundles, particularly they create these bundles to keep genes switched off because you don't want a liver, liver gene or a skin gene coming on in the brain. But that's what happens with aging, we find. And uh, so one way to make sure this process goes slower is to turn on these sirtuin epigenetic regulators. Uh, to use a, a more technical term. And there are seven of these uh, epigenetic regulators, the, the things that prevent the scratches. And uh, we can turn them on with gene therapy. Uh, in mice, we do this. And if you do it in the brain of a mouse, they'll live longer. Do it in the body, they can live longer. But we can't genetically modify ourselves. So what we can, we've also found is that these genes get turned on by adversity adversity or at least perceived adversity if our body thinks we're going to run out of food or we need to run away from a saber-toothed tiger or we're chasing a uh, mastodon then our body says oh you know times might be tough don't put all our energy and resources into growing bigger muscles in fact put that some of that energy into surviving hunkering down and defending the body against uh, toxins against damage and that we know leads to longer life. It slows down this clock of epigenetic changes, uh, which we can measure. Uh, and we also know that um, the ways to mimic adversity include skipping meals, uh, eating less protein in general, being hot and cold. Um, and then the big one um, is eating the right types of food that uh, well, we, we all know a healthy Mediterranean type diet and there are actually chemicals within those foods of a Mediterranean diet in olive oil and red wine that we found in my lab to activate these sirtuins and probably also slow down the clock, but they certainly improve health. And then the last thing, Shane, that I think is really important is what I'm working on is not about keeping people older at the end of life and alive for longer. It's the opposite. We're keeping animals and increasingly we're showing with people that you can keep them younger for longer so that when you're 80, you can actually be 60. Is there, uh, there's so many different directions I want to go in here, but is there a point where fasting becomes, I mean, there is a point unhelpful, right? Like if you don't eat, you will die eventually. Mm -hmm. Is it sort of like you skip one meal is good. You skip two meals is great. You skip six and you're back to good again. Or is there sort of like some sort of limit that we should think about in terms of maximizing the benefit if we are going to yeah. fast? Yeah, well, there's some real key points to hit here. One is we're not talking about malnutrition or starvation. That would not be beneficial. And in fact, when, you know, 10,000 years ago or more, people were not living a long time from fasting because they were not getting enough nutrition. But in our world now, we can have energy, not energy drinks, but drinks that contain enough nutrients. We can make sure that we're not deficient. We can measure things with blood tests. And we can make sure that we're not deficient. But the optimal, the second point is that the optimum is different for everybody, in part because we have different tolerances for not eating. 
but also because we have different micro microbiomes with different genders um, and we just are genetically different. And we know from studies in mice that you can take regular lab mice and mix up their, like breed them in a way that you get a little bit of diversity in these lab mice and give them caloric restriction. So you don't feed them more than, I think it was 40% what they would normally eat. And some mice breeds, strains we call them, lived a lot longer. Some of them died earlier. So you then, but practically what should you do? Well, it seems to be a rule that if you fast at, at least 14 hours, you'll have a lot of health benefits, better metabolic stability, lower blood sugar levels, better cholesterol, these kind of things kick in. Um, a, a popular one is the, um, what, 16, eight, go for 16 hours. So you skip one meal a day and have a late lunch or an early lunch, depending on which one you're skipping. And that uses the period of sleep as a fasting state. And then what I do is I skip breakfast and often I skip lunch, skip lunch as well. And so I'm getting actually more like 20 hours of fasting on a good day. I will say that, uh, Today, I had uh, a little bit of avocado for breakfast because I had to get up really early. So I'm not perfect, and I don't think anyone should strive to be perfect, but you do what you can. Now, there are other people that do uh, a week-long fast. Now, now that's the other extreme. Uh, I wouldn't go further than a week, actually, uh, given what I know. But once you've gone more than three days, there's a special type of uh, recycling of proteins that's very beneficial called autophagy or autophagy. And that takes about three days. Now, I've never done that myself. I'm pretty wimpy when it comes to uh, to these kind of things. I'm a hedonist by nature and very lazy. But I think that if you can go three days or four days, that would be occasionally, not, not of course, not every week, but you could do that every few weeks. And if you do a week-long fast, um, you want to do that maybe four times a year. And those are the, the and, rough guidelines. And if we, if we like... If we fast for two meals and then on the third meal, we eat as many calories as we would have eaten during the rest of the day normally, are we still getting benefits of fasting? Yes. Or does it sort of... Yes, yes, yes. We are. That's the great news. That So uh, take me, for example, I have big dinners um, because I'm, I'm making up for the lack of food during the day. And so I'm not losing weight. Once you, you've hit a set point and you've got your, your body weight and during COVID... I dropped from 150 pounds to 132. I'm now steady at that 132, feeling great, eating tons of food that I always wanted, but it's packed into an hour or two of feeding. Now, how do we know that works? Well, we know from blood tests in humans that it, it looks like it's beneficial. You get the kind of changes that are seen in younger people, things like I mentioned blood glucose, and then there's hormone levels and stress levels, which I've been measuring in myself for a decade. So I can tell you for me, it works. Um, but the, the other thing that's important is that from animal studies that have been done over the last 100 years in mice and rats and dogs, um, it's very clear that it's not just what you eat, it's when you eat. And there's a very famous study that was done by a colleague of mine, Rafael de Cabo at the NIH in Bethesda. And he made three different types of diets for mice. One that had a lot of protein, the other had carbs, the other had fat. And he thought he would find the optimal diet for the mice. Turns out it didn't make any difference. What mattered was when he gave the food. And if he gave it to them just within this short hour-long window every day, they lived dramatically longer, 30% longer. 